Welcome back to another video. This one's going to be about push-pull converters. First thing, I'll talk a little bit about the two possible versions that exist and their particularities without going into the details of exactly all the different principles because there's a ton of videos about that on YouTube already. Next, I'll build one and see how well it works, what the various problems or difficulties are, and how good the efficiency is. So first, let's take a look at the schematic. This is a simplified version of it, obviously, to just represent the concept of it. We can see that there's two low side MOSFETs or switches of some kind and these turn on and off one at a time so that only one half of the primary is being powered at a time. It's important to take note of where the dots on the transformer is to not confuse the polarity of the windings. The secondary in this case is the same as the primary although we could have a simple single winding but then that would require a full bridge rectifier and usually that's not the preferred method because it means that there's a double loss on the rectification stage. At this point there's a little bit of a choice to be made whether to put or not put the inductor. Let's start with the one with the inductor because I think that's better known. In this case the output stage looks like a buck converter and the transformer is just providing isolation. On the primary side we can vary the duty cycle applied to the MOSFETs or the switches and this essentially gets mirrored to the secondary side so there's no surprises here. In an ideal world this works perfectly fine and there's nothing to add to it. Although in reality there's always imperfections and differences in all components. This could be between the two MOSFETs or the signals that are driving them or the windings of the transformer or more likely all of them together combined and this can cause an imbalance in the magnetic flux produced inside of the transformer core. Essentially this means that over time the transformer becomes more and more magnetized in one direction. This leads to overcurrent during one of the two cycles and possibly saturation of the core which leads to even higher overcurrent. The way to solve this is to actively monitor the current going through both of the switches. If we see that there's an imbalance, then we slightly reduce the on time of the MOSFET seeing more current and this will keep them in balance. To do this, we need an IC that's up to the task and has this functionality available. Now let's take a look at the other type without the inductor. In this case, the signals driving the MOSFETs are as close as possible to 100% duty cycle. And what I mean by that is 50 for each one, but they're out of phase by 180 degrees, which means that the output voltage isn't actively controlled in any way. The only thing that determines it is the winding ratio of the transformer. Now I've read on the internet some people saying that not putting the inductor causes high current spikes when any one of the MOSFET turns on. But this is only true if we have duty cycles that are lower than 100%. This is because while both MOSFETs are off, the capacitor on the output is discharging so the voltage drops and then when one of the two MOSFET turns back on we have a voltage imbalance between primary and secondary and so this gives a very quick current spike to bring the capacitor's voltage up to what it theoretically should be but again if we keep the duty cycle at 100% this doesn't happen. But there's another reason to omit the inductor on the output and that is that the circuit has a certain capacity to balance the flux or in other words to avoid saturation of the core. Let's take a look at a hypothetical example that I'll graph here with time on the x-axis and the flux on the y-axis and let's assume that the transformer tends to has its flux increase towards the positive y direction in our case and let's also assume that it's had time to reach a point where when the first MOSFET turns on the flux starts increasing from zero which would already indicate a certain imbalance. If during time T1 the flux increases by an amount B1 then after the short off time we have the flux increase in the opposite direction by an amount B2 during time T2. But during the short off time the flux always tries to go back to zero so it decreases linearly with about the same slope that it does during T1 and T2. And if this reduction in flux during the off time is greater than the difference in the flux increase during T1 and T2, then this means that it will always restore the balance because there will be a very short time in which the flux stays to zero. Which doesn't mean that it will have perfect balance in the flux, but it means that it will stay in a safe zone. And if we size our transformer correctly, this means that it will stay away from saturation. And now you'll probably be thinking, but 
hold on, doesn't this also apply to the circuit with the inductor? I mean, it's the same reasoning, right? Well, actually no, because during the off time, the voltage drop that would be on one of the two secondaries would be on our output inductor, so we don't have this voltage that tries to restore the flux back to zero during the off time, thus we don't have this balancing effect. And by the way, I'll link a short paper by Texas Instruments that talks about this concept, so if you want to check it out and read a little bit more about it, I really suggest taking a look. Alright, finally it's time to build this thing, and the first thing I'll do is wind the transformer. The first two inside layers are the two sides of the secondary. The two important things is always be sure to have the same number of turns on the two sides of the primaries and secondaries respectively. And also be sure that you're always winding them in the right direction, so you respect the dots on the schematic. The last two layers on the outside are 23 turns of this wire, and unfortunately I only had this which is a little bit thinner, and I'm afraid this reduces my efficiency significantly when I test it later. Once again, be sure to wind in the right direction, and to have the same number of turns on the two sides of the tapped primary. Next we build the actual circuit on a breadboard, and here it is. The schematic is the following, and on the left you can see I have the TL494 as a controller. The second IC is a dual MOSFET driver, which is the same one that I've used in previous videos. And then we just have the transformer, and the rectifier, and the capacitor on the output. In this schematic I already added the snubber circuits that I'll talk about later. Now if you're building any kind of projects, whether it's simple like mine, or something a lot more advanced, you should definitely not do like me with breadboards, but get yourself a proper PCB. This is where PCBWay comes in. They offer great quality PCBs, and their prices are really great. Not only that, but they ship really quick, and have great customer service. What's also worth pointing out, is that they're having a big Christmas sales. They're giving away a bunch of coupons, some free Christmas PCB prototypes, and also a bunch of discounts on different services and products like CNC machining, 3D printing, even injection molding, and much, much more. Furthermore, they are even giving away some awesome prizes here, as you can see. I won the soldering iron and the little OLED display for microcontrollers. So head over to PCBWay.com to order your PCBs and win some awesome free prizes in the meantime. The first test I want to do is the current balancing or flux balancing with and without the output inductor. I only made one schematic without the inductor, but it's implied that I'll add it and remove it during some parts of this test. Let's try first with the inductor, and looking at the voltage drop on the two shunts, we can see that they look pretty much identical, so the circuit already seems pretty balanced by itself. This means that I'm going to have to add some kind of imbalance, so what I did was to add a small capacitance across resistor R5 or R7, doesn't really matter. This should make the falling edge of the pulse width modulation signal a little bit slower, because the capacitor has to discharge through the resistor, resulting in a slightly longer pulse width. The current doesn't seem that unbalanced, I mean you can see that there's a difference, but I was expecting a lot worse. And my theory is that the shunts are actually providing a certain amount of resistance that limits the current in that way. But because removing the shunts means I can't measure the current, this makes it so I can't really prove my theory, so I don't know, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Now let's try the same thing without the inductor, and we can see that the waveform is slightly different. In both cases, with and without this added capacitor, the currents seem to be almost identical. So actually, I don't know if this proves my theory, I guess not really, but it was at least interesting to see. The next thing I want to talk about is the voltage spikes on the drain of the MOSFETs. Here, if I probe the drain to source voltage, we can see that there's a very high spike. I know that these MOSFETs hold a lot higher voltage than what this circuit would require, but in an ideal case, we would use transistors that are rated at a maximum of twice what we actually would expect, in theory, and so this means that our MOSFETs would probably break. So the result is that I added these two snubber circuits, and these seem to work very well. In fact, you can see that the voltage spike is almost none now. Since I don't know the value of the parasitic inductance in the transformer, I can't really calculate what the ideal values of the snubber circuit is. 
So I settled on a 100 nanofarad and one kilo ohm resistor values. I noticed that probably the most important thing is actually the diode. In fact, I had to try a lot of different kinds to find one that was actually working right. An interesting thing that I noticed is that by adding the inductor on the output, these voltage spikes on the drain are quite a bit lower. It's not like they don't happen, but they're maybe half as high. So that's interesting. Honestly, I've thought about this some and I can't find a theory to explain this. But in any case, it's probably a little bit more than we would consider to be acceptable. So with or without the inductor on the output, I would recommend always adding the snubber circuits. Before measuring the efficiency, I want to quickly test what the voltage stability of the output is. And this is because without the output inductor, we don't really require a feedback loop to control the output voltage. In an ideal case, we would have zero voltage drop on all the wires, all the diodes, and a nearly 100% duty cycle, which means that the output voltage is completely fixed and cannot change, which limits some applications, but it also means that we don't have to care about controlling it either. So I measured the input and output voltage across the range of loads going from zero to about 20 watts, and we can see that it starts off at slightly under 90%. And then as we increase the current, we can see that it drops slightly in a pretty linear fashion and gets to slightly under 70% of what the ideal value would be. I think that this drop is mostly due to a resistance. And I think most of it is because we're using a breadboard, which is probably the worst thing we can actually do. But unfortunately, I didn't really have the time to start designing a proper PCB. All right, so we finally got to measuring the efficiency. Here I'm using the two multimeters to measure voltage and the two analog current meters to measure current. And these should be pretty accurate, but uh, they're not perfect, obviously, nothing is. I'm going to do four tests with different input voltages. So starting at 12 volts input, we can see that the output is definitely lower. And this is for multiple reasons. One is because we have a step down transformer. And the second reason is because we obviously lose a little bit of voltage over the diodes, the wires and all that stuff. Sweeping through the different output powers from zero to I think nine watts, we can see that we get to an efficiency of 80%. Next, we can try 14 volts on the input. And here we get up to 85%, which I think uh, definitely isn't bad. Next, we have 16 volts on the input. And here we also get to about 85%, but it doesn't seem to go any higher than that. Last but not least, let's try 18 volts. And here we can see that, yeah, we get over 80%, but it might be a little bit lower than the previous two tests. I'm not sure, but I think this might be because we're uh, regulating the voltage for the two ICs. And uh, as we increase the input voltage, they're going to just burn a little bit more power. I don't know if that's enough to justify this slight drop, but it's definitely an idea. All right, well, I guess that's pretty much it for this video. Hopefully you learned something new and you found it entertaining. As always, leave all your thoughts and suggestions in the comment section. I do try to read them all. So thanks for watching till the end and I'll see you in the next one.